I'm Meredith. Hi. I'm going to count on you guys to, uh, to tell me if I'm about to trip over this cord, all right, if you see me like sliding toward it. Um, so there's this fascinating force that astronauts experience when they leave the atmosphere for the first time and, and then repeatedly afterwards. It's called the overview effect. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Overview effect, a couple of you. Okay, it's this reproducible experience that seems to have apparently three experiences that happen all together in rapid succession. So, hold on. Okay, so these three parts are first being awestruck by the beauty of the earth, like this small blue marble hanging in space and just being struck by its beauty. And then second, in rapid sequence, being struck by how utterly perfect for life it is and how fragile it is, hanging in this vast universe that's otherwise hostile to life. And then right after that, in the face of that vast universe, being struck by the interconnectedness of all the beings on that little marble hanging in space. So uh, far better than I talk about it is the astronauts who have experienced it. So here are a couple of just segmented clips. I think you start out with this idea of what it's going to be like and then when you do finally look at the earth for the first time you're overwhelmed by how much more beautiful it really is when you see it for real it's just like it's this dynamic alive place that you see glowing all the time it was truly incredible to be up there um, doing what i always wanted to do my whole life and then to kind of glance back at our planet and uh, see that view was just tremendous. This view of the Earth from space, the whole Earth uh, perspective, I think is the true symbol of this age. On a grand scale, that, you know, we're basically all living in this one ecosystem called Earth. And everything that you do on one side of the ecosystem affects the other side. When I was above the space station, looking down at the space station, looking down at the, you know, against the Earth, and, and seeing this, you know, amazing accomplishment, you know, I was thinking, wow, you know, there was 15 nations that worked together to build this amazing orbital complex in space. And if we can, you know, uh, take these 15 nations and do this amazing accomplishment, imagine what we can do by working together, uh, by setting aside our differences for a common goal to overcome some of the challenges facing our planet. weeks ago, I was sitting on the steps outside a friend's house in upstate New York. And uh, I'm sitting outside in the woods talking via video conference to my friend Colin Bevan. He's an author. So already, like amazing, ridiculous times we live in that one can talk via video conference from the woods. And uh, we were talking about how the world is doing and the really pretty enormous challenges facing humanity right now and facing our planet. And like most of you, I do purpose-driven work. I'm the founder of a company called Think Human, and we work with fast-growth entrepreneurial organizations like SoulCycle, Spotify, IEX, and we work with these companies on supporting them to create cultures where people are thriving. But even though I do purpose-driven work, more and more, I am personally finding that I'm no longer satisfied with just making organizations and the people in them better. I find myself at this interesting point of conflict in my life that as positive as it is, it's no longer enough. And there's this part in my heart that I'm called to look at some real issues that the world is facing. And I'm challenged by that. And at the end of talking about this with Colin, he said, well, maybe start your responsive conversation there, because I bet you're not the only person that's looking to work that out. So here we are. 
And uh, this is going to be a very personal conversation. We're looking at society, but through the lens of ourselves. So the first question I asked myself and that I have for you is, how do you want to leave the world when you're not in it anymore? And uh, in my own experience, and I would suspect likely yours, mostly people like across the gamut of the different backgrounds of people I've met, people, we generally want to leave the world better than we found it. And I'm not saying we actually do, but I'm saying that by intent, most of us want to leave a positive legacy and want to leave the world better than we found it. And then the justification of immediacy gets in the way, but with the exception of those who had like real abuse or real brokenness, we all get glimpses of this connection to one another. And you people in this room even have the audacity to go as far as to think we can actually do something about it to make the world better. Uh, we're here at this conference because we all sense this potential for organizations and businesses to impact the world. And we see this new paradigm where organizations are driven by a vision of one humanity and of wanting to salvage the planet from destructive actions that are still happening at shocking levels every day. So now's the part that this conversation gets personal. So imagine, if you will, looking down at the world 300 years from now. You and I are both long since gone, and you're looking down at the world that you long to see. And, uh, Everybody know about the butterfly effect? Yes, yeah, I see a lot of nods, but for anybody who doesn't, the idea of, butterf of the butterfly effect is from chaos theory. And uh, it goes, the saying goes something like this, that the flutter of a butterfly's wing in New York can cause a typhoon in Tokyo. So imagine, from the perspective of the positive impact of a butterfly effect, imagine looking down at the world 300 years from now, and the po positive butterfly effect of your own life. So take a moment, if you're willing, and close your eyes. You can put the things on your lap or in your hands down. Close your eyes, take a big deep breath, if you're willing, and look down at that world that you very personally want to see 300 years from now. And what's happening on the planet as you look down on it? As an impact of your personal flutter of the butterfly's wing of your life, What's happening in the world? And this is about courage and innovation, but let me take the pressure off of you that you can change your answer tomorrow. This is just for the purpose of this conversation. What do you see? What is that world that you long to see? And then open your eyes and just take a moment to personally reflect. Most of you have a handout, and if you don't, just open a journal or a notebook and write for a second. And to the best of your ability, avoid writing the things you've heard yourself say before or your own elevator pitch, but actually what touched you in that moment. So we live in amazing times. That's like the ridiculously good news for us, is we live in ridiculously amazing times where we have fewer deaths proportionally than ever before in human history. We have the technology, resources, capacity to figure out how to feed all of humanity. We have the capacity to figure out how to provide clean water to all of the globe. Technology has just radically, awesomely transformed the world in ways that we see. And in the face of increasingly complex problems, we live in this era that we can actually do something about it. And companies are popping up solving previously insurmountable issues, like the 19-year-old kid who created the robot that cleans plastic out of the oceans, or the Stanford student who's created a business that uh, uses, uh, what do you call it, recycled mobile phones, old flip phones, and retrofits this extension onto them so in rural Africa they can take blood tests and get access to treatment, diagnosis and treatment they wouldn't uh, otherwise have. So, What's possible in the world now for the regular person like me, like you, is totally off the hook. And there's this new kind of leader emerging, not just 
that traditional kind of leader that has stirred our spirits in the past, those movements, those movement leaders like uh, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, but those, those movement leaders that have been the world changers and that we all admire, but there's this new kind of leader emerging that are business leaders. And they're not just business leaders that are for profit first and then do good later, like make a foundation and do good down the line, but the domains of business and legacy are starting to blur, right? And they're no longer distinct. And these new kinds of business leaders are building a product or a platform that's incredible. And they're doing good for the world and they're profiting. So this moment that we're in is unlike any other before, where we're now actually living in that do good and do well world, where you can do good for the world and do well financially. And I wanna make it really clear, I am not limiting this conversation to social impact businesses or those companies that are willing to take on the practices of triple bottom line accounting. Like, that's great that that's happening and they're on the leading edge of something, but more and more regular old businesses that are out for profit are now beginning to take on, looking through this new lens of what we're starting to call dimensional good, where the decision-making filter becomes, is it good for me and is it good for you? And is it good for the community? And is it good for the world? And where each relationship and transaction and decision is moderated through the lens of, is it good for all involved? Because those transactions are ultimately better for all of us. And more and more regular old companies are starting to take on looking through this lens. And we get to work with one of, uh, many of them. So I thought I'd let one of them speak for themselves. Let's see if I can get this going for you. Flatiron, it's an unwavering passion to make a very, very significant change in the way in which cancer patients are treated. We wanted to do something we cared about. Personally, we had some family cases of cancer, which really changed our mindset. At Flatiron, every day really feels like you're working on a massive problem that's going to impact hundreds of thousands and millions of people around the world. Every day that we come into work, we're working on cancer, which is affecting all of our families, I think makes a big difference in Flatiron's culture. I think at some point you realize you want to do something a little more meaningful, a little more impactful. Honestly, lots of people look at me and say, you know, why'd you make the jump? Frankly, I was at the top of my career. I had lots of funding from the government or the National Institutes of Health and you know, lots of wonderful students and a big lab. But at the end of the day, I was solving problems at a small scale and coming to a place like Flatiron allowed us to really jump in a bigger direction and including my personal impact and my personal thinking about taking care of people with cancer. Flatiron is a billion dollar plus company. We're actually living in this era now of profit and real planet changing legacy work. And we're at this, we get to live at this amazing time where we have the resources, the opportunity, the connectedness to focus on bringing our real butterfly effect work into existence. Not just doing good, but being imaginative and courageous enough to point to to point toward that deepest vision that we see. But there's this problem. There's this problem that pulls us away from that deepest vision, and I certainly experience it, and I imagine you do too. It's this tendency, or sorry, this tension between immediacy and legacy, and the pressures of what we want in the moment pulls us astray, and then the justification that we make up about that keeps us pointing in that direction. So we're pulled by pressures as human beings, whether it's hitting our quarterly numbers or satisfying commitments that we made to clients or avoiding getting in trouble for something or um, meeting commitments that we made to our boss. But in the face of what's pressing in on us, in the moment we make funny choices, right? So here's a kind of funny guy who can uh, do a better job than me talking about it. See if I can get him to go. No? Maybe not. Hold on. Have you ever seen somebody in like they're at an intersection and they want to make a left, but they're in the right all the way right lane because they messed up. So now they're okay. Here's the here's the guy. He's in the right lane, 
and there's a whole lot of cars, like 6th Avenue, like a lot of cars, and he wants to make that left. So what does he do? He just does it anyway. He just goes ahead and he just shoves his car through everybody's life without any... And everybody's beep, honking and outraged. And you always see the guy go, I, I have to, I have to. There's no other possible thing I could do. What else could I do except go up one more block and then go left and take four seconds? So we can poke fun at it, but this is real life, right? And we're all about being the best version of ourselves until what we want in the moment is pressing in on us. So it has obvious implications that we see in business. Like we talk about, okay, business, we live at this time that business can change the world, but we see in business how the pressure that weigh in on individuals in business impact the kinds of decisions that we make. And I mean, on one end of the spectrum, it's, you can look at really obvious deci decisions that are made like uh, at DuPont, the person or people who were responsible for burying research that a bunch of their chemicals were causing cancer massively to like hundreds of thousands of people. And we can, we can argue that, well, they're evil people because they made that decision and we can argue back and forth about that. But uh, I think we can mostly look and see that the people making these kinds of decisions in the moment are weighed in by pressures that are coming at them and that these are people for the most part, that are coaching their kids' Little League team and going out of their way to help elderly people in their family and looking for where they can do good. But in the face of pressures weighing in on us, we make weird choices. And I can see the effect, as I imagine you can too, broadly out in the world, but I also am struggling and searching in this immediacy legacy tension all the time in small choices like uh, our company taking on a client that I know is not a values match for us and justifying it because of fill in the blank, because it's covering overhead, because it's helping people there at that company and I can see the positive impact. I can come up with whatever justification I need to say, all right, I know it's not, a, I know it's off, but I'm gonna do it anyway and here's why. Or bigger, uh, more significant integrity issues where in the face of that immediacy tension, I make other bad choices. Like seven years ago, I had a former business partner and our relationship was coming apart in a big, bad, escalating way. And in the face of that, she asked me to send all of the contracts that we had in our business. And I'm pulling them all together and reviewing them to send to her. And as I'm looking at them, I see one where there's a line that I had totally forgotten about. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, fuck. I forgot about this line. I'm not managing this. She's going to attack me, and it's going to turn into a whole unnecessary thing. Whether she was actually going to attack, you know, attack me or not is a good question, but that's what it looked like to me in the moment. I deleted the line and sent it off to her with the rest of the contracts. It was a Friday afternoon. It wasn't until the Monday morning that I was like, okay, that's fucked up. Let me tell her what I did and clean that up. But the point is that in the face of the pressures that weigh in on us, we make weird choices. And when we're not making poor choices, we're making distracted choices. In fact, I think sometimes the biggest things that take us astray from that real legacy work are not the major integrity issues, but those small things that pull us off course from that vision that we saw. And we make other things more important, whether it's status or meeting superficial goals. And we sell out in small ways on pursuing what we most want to see for the world. And then we justify it to ourselves. And that justification, I think, is actually the most dangerous thing because the distraction itself, like that pressure and pull to take a different action, that's human, but then the justification is what then points us and entrenches us newly off course. And then we end up doing work that's good, and in many cases, work that's even good for the world, but not doing our real butterfly effect work. And uh, that work that's most true to our soul, which isn't good for the world, and it's not good for us, right? It cuts in on our own relationship with ourselves. 
So what we're really talking about is being able to work with ourselves, which takes elevating our level of presence. And so is, is anybody willing to work with me in a little exercise, a uh, little experiment? I didn't come here, by the way, with answers. I came here with, uh, in the spirit of experimentation with an inquiry. So yeah, great. Thank you so much. What's your name? Kristen. Kristen. Okay, thank you. So what's that butterfly effect work and vision that you saw? Can you come over here? Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> In a nutshell, it's that we don't fight anymore because we figured out ways to make communities that actually nurture people and all of their basic needs and their self-actualization as well. Okay, so people's needs are met yes. and people are living peacefully with one another. In theory. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the vision. <laughs> that's the vision. Okay, yeah. great. And uh, I'm sorry, one more time, your name? Kristen. It's Kristen. I just want to have you note, Kristen did what I almost always experience people do, which is like diminish it somewhat. Like I have the vision, but like, oh, in theory, because like, let me not even just say that that's really the world that I want to see, right? And I say that not about Kristen, but so you can see about yourselves or, and ourselves, how we do that, right? Like to water it down. So if you're willing, Maybe. what are your, what are your forms of avoidance or the shiny things that pull your attention away from being at work on that? That's a really good question. I might need more time. Um, forms of avoidance. I think it's, it's really easy to make choices that um, in the, the short term make more sense for you. For example, I have a client who was recently acquired by Amazon, and through the process of working with this client, I've decided to boycott every Amazon service. And we can talk more about that later if you want to. I would highly encourage it. Um, but like, I bought a book from Amazon the other day because I could not find it at Powell's, which is supposed to have all the books <laughs> in Portland, you know, um, because it was easy for me, um, because it was like a book that I really wanted and needed at that time, mm -hmm. theoret needed. Yep. Um, so I, I think that's a really big one, like a form of avoidance where you're like, I could really wait. Mm -hmm. I could get back on the, the library list mm -hmm. to do it. I could do like five other things, but I really wanted it right yes. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kristen, thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. All right, is, no, not in this moment, thank you. Is one other person willing to share? Yeah, great, thank you. And start by saying your name. Uh, my name is Ala. Okay, Ala, and what's that vision you saw? As uh, your personal flutter of the butterfly's wings of your life. I saw that every person gets to really do what they're meant to do in this world and find other people that are passionate about it and do it together. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they're not worried about just be, like meeting basic needs. They, they can actually put all their attention on doing what they're supposed to do in yes. this world. So they're not worried about meeting their basic needs and can focus on what they're really passionate about. Yeah. Okay, and awesome. find other people to cooperate to that are also passionate about it and like come yes. together in a community and like do that thing that they're yes. supposed to do. Anybody else interested in a world like that where people are not focused on meeting their basic needs? Yeah, you see a lot of hands. <laughs> so what are your forms of avoidance that keep you from being at work on focusing on creating that world? Uh, well, I focus on my ba meeting my basic needs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I watch Netflix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the real truth, right? Isn't that I'm like the human? Come on, girl. That is so awesome. That is, I mean, we all love Netflix, but also just awesome to tell the truth, right? Yeah. That's like the kind of shit that gets in the way. So it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, I don't know. There's, there's a way that it's frightening to try to do this thing which feels so overwhelming and so big. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Yes. Yeah. I'll just watch Netflix instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so or I'll read a book or I'll take a class mm -hmm. because obviously I need to learn more rather than do. Yes. So learning yeah. and entertainment yeah. pull you away. So you have to do the job to meet your basic needs and then in your other time learning and entertainment so that you can distract yourself from being at work on this thing that's really the world you want to see. Totally. Okay. And uh, what are some things you might be avoiding? I'm, I'm avoiding um, what I feel like is resistance to, to this dream, like people saying that it's impossible or, um, and also just being seen. I think mm -hmm. in that in this kind of large way, 
And, um, and also, there is a way that the current system, for me, I feel like current systems have to be disrupted or really like taken down mm -hmm. for that to happen. And, um, and so I'm avoiding just like taking on that huge, what I feel is like a huge task. Okay. So you're avoiding being seen. Yeah. And you're avoiding what feels too big. Too big. Okay. And uh, what do you think is the biggest thing you're avoiding? Disappointment. Mm -hmm. Anybody can relate maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So what might you need to stop doing in your life to be able to refocus some of your energies on bringing forth this vision that you are hungry for? What do I need to stop doing? Making excuses. Mm -hmm. okay. Hiding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, certainly stop watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, or maybe not stop altogether, but when you notice that it's like that distraction. That distraction, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel prepared to take on any amount of avoiding hiding? Like, is there some little inch forward that feels within your reach? Because I think when it comes to this butterfly flutter, when it's like the whole world of what the world looks like 300 years from now, that we see the, gig the enormity of it gets in the way of the next first step. So it really does. It yeah, really does. it feels so overwhelming. Right. So yeah. if you just look at that next first step of what you might be prepared to share here with these people, mm -hmm. or even if you don't want to share here with these people, but in the next three days, to take some courageous and new step forward to forward your legacy work. Is there something you can see? I feel like sharing. I feel like sharing the vision that I have, and being like actually public, like you know, telling people about it and sharing that. Awesome, awesome. And uh, is there a specific incremental risk that's meaningful that you can take in the next thirty days? That when you look out thirty days from now, you can say, "I will have accomplished X, whatever it is," and then who can hold you accountable for that? very detailed question. <laughs> so it's just what do you want to have accomplished 30 days from now? Just so you can kind of like in some small way box yourself into a new manageable, small, imaginable risk mm -hmm. that takes some courage to forward your legacy work. Something that you'll have done 30 days from now and who can hold you accountable. I think I want to I write like a Medium article about this and really what I feel. and. Um, I have a business partner. She can hold me accountable. Amazing. That's so amazing. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much you. for doing that with, for all of us. Yeah. All right, so uh, lucky for you, you're not off the hook. Now is your turn to turn to the handout that you have. And if you didn't get a handout, I think some, some of you came in and didn't end up at a seat that had one, just open a journal. And I'll say the questions so you can actually go to work at them. And you even can notice how much resistance comes up for you about like, I don't want to answer these questions. I did it in my head, I'm good. Right, versus being willing to actually take the plunge to look at them for yourselves. So first just take a moment to reconnect to that vision that you want to see for the world and what that looks like. And then answer the question, what are your forms of avoidance, the shiny things that pull your attention? Then what are some of the things you might be avoiding? You want to answer? Is that why you raised your hand? Yeah, sure. No, but I'll take it. I might be avoiding relationships, like business relationships. So I keep, um, I mean, I've done it in the past, but some of them have gone poorly. And so now I just keep jumping from amazing idea to amazing idea until it gets to the point where I need help because it's a lot simpler if it's just a fantasy in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So. And so uh, you're avoiding the risk of what about relationships? That they can go poorly and painfully at mm -hmm. times. Yeah, so you're avoiding the risk of pain. Yeah. Okay, anybody else avoiding the risk of pain? Right, we would all like to avoid the risk of pain or failure or embarrassment, but in the, in the face of the vision that we long to see for the world, I mean, this is a very personal decision, 
I'm not trying to lay something out there that it has to go some particular way, but there might be some small amount of emotional pain that we're willing to take to see that, you know, or embarrassment or failure to see that come through. And thank you for sharing that. Did everybody have a chance to write their answer to that question, what might you be avoiding? Yeah, can I get some nods, yes or no? Just so I can, okay, great. And then what's the biggest thing you're avoiding? What might you want to stop doing because it takes you away from that legacy work and that legacy that you long to see? And what are you prepared to share here or if not here over the next three days in your life with people, with others in your life to take a new courageous step that you haven't taken before toward that butterfly effect work? Look and see if this next question can call forth something different for you, which is what specific incremental risk are you willing to take that's meaningful to forward your legacy work? And in 30 days, what will you have accomplished? And be, um, be real with yourself. I'm not saying like overcommit that you're gonna have solved all of the globe's challenges in 30 days. Like what, what can you imagine you can actually accomplish in the next 30 days that would be meaningful to you and who can hold you accountable for that as an accountability partner that you'd be willing to ask? All right, so now find two other humans to play with. So you're gonna make a triad. You plus two other humans, find a triad. First do that and then I'll tell you what happens in the triad. All right, everybody have a triad. Raise your hand if you're lonely and looking for people. No, okay, great. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do in the triad. You're gonna share what was meaningful or resonant for you about the work that you did. And as the speaker, when it's your turn, do your best not to diminish it. Like, oh, make it smaller or like minimize it in some way or make it less vulnerable for yourself. So do your best to share what actually touched you and what you saw. And then as listeners, your job is to practice your active listening, not to um, give advice or um, modify or build on, but just really get their world, okay? And then when one person is done, you can naturally move on to the next person. You don't have to wait for a ring of the bell or anything, so go for it. You don't have to read the questions word for word. You I mean you don't have to read your work word for word if you don't want. You're just going to share what moved you, and what you are moved to action about. And you can share as much or as little of that as you want. So, look around the room. At the faces in the room. Whatever it is, whatever vision it is that you saw or place you're at about going one small courageous step deeper toward it, there are people who can see this through with you. And we all wanna leave the world better in some way. And we live in these crazy times when we can, but given our humanness, in the face of that legacy immediacy tension, we have to elevate our presence to come back to ourselves about that. And it doesn't take like, it's, it's not complex. It just takes re-noticing what that true north is for ourselves versus where we might have gotten a few degrees off and then justified it because it's still good work. And then noticing what's getting in the way and stop justifying those small sellouts and look for what small, courageous new step that, like, feels manageable are you willing to take or are we willing to take to fulfill on that legacy? Because when we do that, when we can see where we're not focused on our deepest butterfly effect work and we refocus, that's when we can build those businesses that do actually change the world. So thanks. <laughs>